Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us at Capital Health Network and welcome to our session on symptom management in breathlessness. Uh, as a home-based palliative care nurse working in the community, there were many times when I was visiting or called out to patients suffering severe breathlessness and I felt quite ill-equipped to know how to best support these patients. So now that I work at CHN in the palliative care planning manager role, um, it's one of my interests to increase our skills and knowledge in caring for pe people suffering with debilitating breathlessness. So thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Ngunnawal country today. I just uh, can't advance my slide. There we go. That we're meeting on Ngunnawal country today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and their connection with culture and community and also pay my respect to other peoples connected to the land we're meeting on and also extend that respect to any ab other Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people present today. So we have a short time to pack in a lot on uh, breathlessness. So um, I'd just like to let you know that one of the reasons that we're providing this education service is we are currently trialling uh, at the ACT Breathlessness Intervention Service. We call that ABUS. And ABUS is a pilot. It's a free in-home service delivered by Southside Physio based on the breathing thinking functioning model. It's been co-designed with consumers to ensure that we meet the unique dis, um, needs of, of the people in Canberra. And Sim will follow in a, later on talking about the eligibility and referral process to um, access ABUS. Uh, we are also very fortunate to be uh, supported by the UTS team in the co-design phase in evaluation of ABUS. Our ultimate aim as, as we um, gather evidence is to lobby um, and really work hard to see something like this service rolled out across the ACT. Uh, we're already seeing some really positive outcomes and we're looking forward to uh, producing an evaluation. So tonight, uh, we are going to have three sessions. The first session will be part one of Breathlessness with Mary Roberts. Second, we have Sim or Simon Kra talking about the ABUS service and again, Breathlessness with Mary. At the end of that, we will have a question and answer time. Uh, please feel free to pop your questions into the Q&A box. We won't be stopping to answer those questions as we go along, but we will save them for the end. So please pop them in there as they come to your mind. You don't have to wait to keep it to the end, but we will answer them at the end. The other thing is at the end of the session, when you log out, you will be redirected to a survey, um, which is our post-event survey. Um, in that survey, it's um, important that you, if you are wanting to gain CPD points for the events, that you fill in your details. And also the survey helps um, tell us uh, how we can improve these sessions and plan for future events. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I'd like to introduce Mary Roberts to present the first part of our workshop this evening. Uh, we are very fortunate to be working with uh, Mary. She has a Master's of Nursing and a Master's of Palliative Care and also 30 years clinical experience of working in respiratory medicine with a special, special interest in COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary rehab and breathlessness management. Mary is a national and international speaker and she's authored and co-authored uh, 20 pub, over 20 publications and 70 research abstracts. She's an active member of the Lung Foundation Australia, the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand, and most recently uh, received a prestigious Lung Legend Award from Lung um, Foundation Australia. Currently, 
Mary is a clinical nurse consultant working at Westmead in the respiratory ambulatory care team, running a breathlessness intervention service, which includes a 24 seven respiratory hotline providing care and advice for patients with respiratory disease. So we're looking forward to Mary's presentation. We've got a lot to learn from her and please enjoy. Thanks very much. Don't forget to pop your answers in the Q&A box. Thank you. Can you let me know when you can see my screen? Okay, I've got a thumbs up. All right, so thank you very much. Oh. You're right, Ma Ross? Mary. It's can you flip the screens like you did last time? Oh, bugger. okay. Yep. Is that better? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you for that lovely introduction. So, um, as Ros alluded to, I'm going to be doing two parts of this presentation. The first part's going to be on breathlessness management, and the second part is just a, a quick update on all of the different inhalers that we use in um, respiratory medicine because it is getting a little bit confusing. So breathlessness. I love this um, quote from Tim Winton in, in Breathe, and it's, it's funny, you never think much about breathing until it's all you think about. And when when we talk to our patients, we often hear that, you know, it's they think about every breath they take. Um, and it's something that we don't think about. This is just a quick little video from one of our patients talking about breathlessness. Whoops. That's a terrible feeling. You can't get your breath, you know. And it takes about five minutes to really settle down again. When I exert myself, I always get short breaths. I couldn't do what I used to do. Like what take, took me five minutes to do before, it take me a couple of hours to do, you know, like changing the sheets on the bed and um, hanging the washing out and doing the housework and I can't do a lot of that anymore. It's very hard to do things when you can't breathe, you know. And so I think the first thing that we really have to do in our clinical practice is actually acknowledge breathlessness. Uh, it's interesting because patients often won't volunteer it unless we ask about it. And if we don't ask about it, they think, well, there's nothing that can be done about it, so I'm not going to say anything. So some of the questions that we like to ask patients is, are you troubled by breathlessness? And what makes you breathless? And the most important question I think we have to ask our patients is, what have you stopped doing to prevent breathlessness because when you see them in the rooms or you know on a home visit they're not breathless because they've been sitting waiting for you waiting to see you and they will limit their activity so that they can talk to you so it's really important once you know how breathless they are the next thing you need to do is say is it proportional to their pathophysiology and if it's not you have to look for other causes um you know and and it's things about are their comorbidities optimally treated? So yes, they might have COPD or ILD, but have they got some untreated heart disease or heart failure? Is something else going on? One of the, the classics that we always see is that post-nasal drip that really does uh, sinus disease where patients won't take their nasal sprays because they're disgusting. Um, and they then put up with this ongoing breathlessness because they've got this post-nasal drip. 
The other thing you have to be aware of is medication adherence. And I really don't like that word, but it is something that you actually, when you ask questions, well, are you taking that nasal spray? Are you taking your puffer? Give them permission to say, no, I'm not because I hate it. It tastes funny. It does that. Because unless you ask them and give them permission, they're not going to tell you. So when we talk about breathlessness, I think it's really important that we have some sort of um, measurement tool. And I think simple, you know, the pain people have had this down pat for, you know, 10, 20 years. I go into the respiratory ward now and although the patient's been admitted for breathlessness, no one actually rates their breathlessness. It drives me crazy. But if you go into a surgical room or a surgical ward, everyone, you know, what's their pain today? It's zero out of 10, it's five out of 10. So I think we have to start measuring it. And some of the things that we do is, is using just a visual analog scale or a numerical rating scale. If your patient goes to pulmonary rehab, they might use the Borg scale. Uh, it's, it's a weird kind of a scale. It's used a lot in respiratory medicine and it makes sense to us, but I think to uh, the general practice population, it's not a useful tool because as you can see on the slide, it's not evenly weighted. So although it's naught to 10, five is not moderate. Uh, five is severe so it's it's a, it's a strange tool so although we use it in in pulmonary rehab I'd probably just go for a normal visual analog scale or a numerical rating scale and it's really important that you ask them to rate it both at rest while you're sitting here how bad your breathlessness and how bad is it on exertion so what makes you the most breathless when you do that task how breathless are you and that gives you a really good starting point as to what we need to manage I think it's really important to also stress that breathlessness does not equal hypoxemia. So if I got you all to run up, what's the hill with the Telstra Tower on it? If I got you to run up there, you'd all be puffing um, and freezing cold. Uh, but if I checked your pulse oximetry, if I checked your oxygen saturation, it would probably be normal. So what we have to do is actually tell our patients that, you know, the quick patients will think that the quick answer is if you give me oxygen I'll be fine oxygen does not cure breathlessness and I'll go into that a little bit uh, more in the next few slides so what I want to do I like this slide and this is um, a diagram by the late Sarah Booth and she was um, an anaesthetist who uh, then became a palliative care physician and she specialized in breathlessness and what she showed is that breathlessness is a really complex symptom and it's not just because of the lungs and that it's an interplay between um, the lung and chest wall receptors. It's also um, feedback with the uh, chemo receptors. But then you've also got this interaction between the limbic system and the association cortex. So all of these things are going into the brain and that will give you the sensation of breathlessness. So as you can see there, there's not a lot about hypoxemia. It is about emotions, about memories, about what your brain thinks it should get and what the brain is actually getting yet when it comes to respiratory feedback. Uh, this is another diagram that Sarah Booth came up and she talks about the generation of breathlessness. And she said that breathlessness is actually an interplay of three different cycles. There's the breathing cycle, which is the actual um, inefficient breathing. So it's the stretch receptors, it's the chemo receptors. Um, and patients will feel that increased work of breathing and that feeds into an increased respiratory rate, increased use of accessory muscles and that dynamic hyperinflation that we see in COPD. At the same time, we then have this um, other cycle going on, which is the functioning cycle. And that's going to be if you don't use it, you, you lose it. And if we don't use our muscles, they become less efficient, they become more weak and the less they do, the less they're able to do. So it's really got to do with changes in mu muscle fibres with an alteration in the type 1 and type 2 muscle, muscle fibres. And then you've got this thinking, and as I said, the limbic system and uh, the cortex, and if people start thinking about dying, if they start thinking that last time they got breathless, they ended up in hospital, 
they actually that actually makes it worse and the the anxiety feeds into it you get more breathless and more breathless and more anxious you get the more anxious you get the more breathless you get and so what we have to do is when we treat breathlessness is we actually have to identify which of these cycles is the main driver of breathlessness and how then we can treat it and that's what abus will do is they will actually assess the patient's symptoms look at all of these things and then treat every single aspect that is um, appropriate for the patient. So the first thing that we do is we look at the non-pharmacological strategies for treating breathlessness. When I first started my breathlessness clinic about eight years ago, I thought that I'd be putting a lot of patients on opioids or anxiolytics. Um, but what we decided to do was to try all the non-pharmacological strategies for eight weeks first. And if they, um, and then if, Patients are still breathless after that would go to medication. Interestingly enough, probably 95% of our patients are treated just with non-pharmacological intervention. And here I've just got eight squares and we've got our different techniques and they're under the different headings of that breathing, thinking, functioning cycle. So we give education, medication, adherence. We talk about handheld fans, energy conservation, relaxation and cognitive behavioural therapy, uh, breathing techniques and positions to relieve breathlessness, exercise, physical activity, pulmonary rehab, and of course, what to do in a crisis. So the first thing you have to do is dispel the myths. I always ask my patients, what goes through your head when you get really breathless? Then they'll say, if I knew I had oxygen, I'm going to die. I'm going to faint. I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm never going to catch my breath. Stop. Breathlessness, although it is frightening, although it is horrible, breathlessness in itself is not dangerous. So patients are not doing themselves harm by getting breathless. Now, of course, there's some nuance to that. Some things that cause breathlessness are dangerous and we have to treat it. But that breathlessness that people get for general uh, daily activities, if they've got heart failure, if they've got COPD, if they've got ILD, that breathlessness is not dangerous. And that is one of the key things patients need to hear. If you can tell them that, that straight away goes to that thinking cycle and will help calm them down. The other thing that I say to my patients is, okay, you've got, you get breathless every day doing different tasks. How many times have you died? How many times have you had a heart attack? How, so you really have to dispel those myths and that will help um, break some of that anxiety cycle. The other thing that we have to do is check that medication um, and inhale uh, medication adherence and check inhaler technique because if people aren't taking their medications correctly, we're not optimizing or we're not optimally managing the actual medical condition that's causing the breathlessness. Um, don't think that all your patients are great at taking their medications because let me tell you, most patients are rubbish at it and we just don't ask. Um, there was a systematic review looking at inhaler technique in patients with COPD and asthma and the overall prevalence of optimal inhaler technique was only 31%. So that means that 69% of patients are not using their inhalers properly. And if we can start addressing that, that will also reduce in breathlessness. And look, you know, I'm not bagging out in uh, patients because there are so many different inhalers out there. And each inhaler device takes 10 or 12 different steps in order to optimally deliver that medication. So it's tough and we need to review the technique every time we see them. And it's the GP's role, it's the nurse's role, it's the pharmacist's role, it's the physio's role, it's every healthcare professional that comes in contact with a patient should be checking medication technique. I don't know if you've uh, seen this video. I love it. So I'm going to quickly play it. My asthma. They said they'd fix it, but it didn't make any difference at all. Well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? No. Nope. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? Now, although that's house and you think that only happens in TV, it's not 
true. It happens everywhere. The amazing things that I see in, when people are trying to show me how they use their inhaler. So once again, don't say, can you use your inhaler? Are you using your, your inhaler? Show me how you use your inhaler. It's a much better way and that way you can actually see what they're doing and you can pick up little tips and tricks on how to improve it. Um, and don't think just because the patient has been in hospital that the nurses there would have taught them. We did a study at Westmead Hospital and we looked, we checked um, the nurses working in a specialised respiratory unit and we asked, how confident are you in teaching inhaler technique? And how competent are you in using your inhalers? And the results were really disappointing. These were senior nurses that have been working in the area for so long and their knowledge of inhalers was almost just as bad. And um, there's been studies looking at community pharmacists, looking at doctors, uh, looking at different settings, and the results are very similar. We are rubbish at teaching inhaler use. So please, if you've got a got a patient that's on an inhaler, go to the Australian Lung Foundation website. They've got little videos. You are shown how to use them properly. And if you don't know how, at least if you show the video, the patient's getting that best, best evidence-based uh, teaching. Once again, as I said, oxygen does not cure breathlessness. Patients love it because I think, you know, I think it's more of a psychological thing. If I get my oxygen on, I'm safe. Something's happening. But there's been quite a few studies that show that it actually doesn't relieve breathlessness. Um, here's uh, two great articles. One is a Cochrane review looking at um, oxygen therapy and it can be effective during exertion, but it really has limited effects just on daily activity. There was um, a great study um, by David Croc, uh, David Caro's crew, and what they did is they compared piped air with piped oxygen and found actually that there was no difference in the relief from breathlessness. So patients were given oxygen via nasal prongs. It was blinded, so they didn't know it was oxygen. They wrote down how much they could do each day. The next day they were given uh, nasal prongs. They were having air in it write down how much you can do each other. And there was no difference between oxygen or air. So it was actually the cold flow of gas rather than the gas itself that relieves breathlessness. So, you know, the um, summary uh, or the conclusion of this study was the less burdensome strategy should be considered first um, in non-hypoxemic patients. So we're talking non-hypoxemic patients, breathless patients. Um, but there is great evidence that a handheld fan, that cold flow of air on the lower half of the face, actually can reduce the sensation of breathlessness. Um, there's, I think the great thing about fans is they're simple, they're portable, they're cheap, they're, um, they don't combust. Um, whereas we see lots of problems with oxygen, with people smoking, getting too close to the birthday candles, cooking on the barbecue and it's going up in flames. This is a fantastic resource that we can give our patients. I've got a note there that says warning, not all fans are equal. And we actually did a study looking at uh, using different fans and which ones work best. Because if you are going to suggest a patient use a handheld fan um, to relieve their breathlessness, you want to make sure that they don't buy a dodgy one. This one in the picture is from the Lung Foundation. Um, it's got soft blades. It's nice and easy to hold, even for arthritic hands, easy to turn on and off. It's a really good fan. I don't have... Um, shares in it but it, it is one of the best and, and our study showed that it was one of the ones that the patients uh, preferred. I'm just going to show you um, this video that uh, the UTS team and I put together about handheld fans that goes into a little bit more of the theory. Being breathless is disgusting. It's the worst feeling you can have in your life. They say you just have a shower or a bath, it's just because of the way my breathing is. I just don't have a choice. I do what I can do and that's all I can do. But it is still the worst feeling you can have in your life. I can obviously say that. 
Chronic or persistent breathlessness is a frightening and disabling symptom. Although it cannot be cured, there are still a lot of things we can do to support people to manage their breathlessness. The breathing thinking functioning clinical model shows how different approaches can be integrated to address unhelpful breathing patterns, emotional and cognitive drivers, and the vicious cycle of deconditioning and social isolation, which are all features of this disabling symptom. There is high level of evidence for a range of non-pharmacological strategies, including breathing techniques, pacing and positioning, anxiety management, and physical activity. But the most simple and effective thing that we can do is offer patients a handheld fan. So you get the patient to turn the fan on and incorporate breathing techniques at the same time. So you want them to move the fan across the bottom half of their face so they get the airflow, and then they can incorporate breathing techniques such as breathing around the rectangle or concentrating on the outlet. So they'll be going. This will enable them to catch their breath quicker and control their breathlessness in a more rapid way. Recovering from breathlessness is what the pen helps you do. It makes you relax and get your breathing back into line. And that's the most important thing. Research about the fan is still ongoing, but what we think about the mechanism is that there are at least three ways in which the fan helps people with breathlessness. The first is that the fan stimulates the trigeminal nerve, particularly the second and third division. And then that signals the brain to say, you're getting more airflow, more ventilation than you really are. The second is that the fan seems to increase expiratory time. And this then reduces dynamic hyperinflation. By reducing dynamic hyperinflation, it delays patients getting to the point where they can't take in enough tidal volume to meet their requirements when they're exercising. And this seems to be a very powerful mechanism for a lot of patients. Reducing dynamic hyperinflation allows people to exercise longer and to exercise more, thereby building their muscle mass, which helps to reduce breathlessness again by a different mechanism in the long period of time. If I have a really bad attack, I have to use the ventilator and the pen but normally I can get over it with the fan, which is, for me, which is good. The third mechanism by which the fan works is a psychological mechanism that seems to go well beyond just a placebo effect, that using a fan gives patients control over their breathlessness, and that then breaks the cycle between anxiety, breathlessness, and more anxiety that tends to drive breathlessness. So there are at least three mechanisms by which fans act to reduce breathlessness. This means that fans are really important for all breathless patients, not just those with end-stage disease or with anxiety, but everyone who gets breathless may well benefit from a fan. I take the fan everywhere I go. I've always got it with me. If I get really bad, then I've got relief. And that's the most important thing to me, is having the relief. Research suggests that the fan benefits around 80% of people who try it. And importantly, benefit depends not really on the stage of disease, but on how much the breathlessness interferes with everyday life. As of mid-2022, there were five published meta-analyses showing that the fan can reduce breathlessness intensity across a whole range of different illnesses. We conducted a secondary analysis of clinical trial data that showed that the fan can also help improve a patient's physical activity. We now have neuroimaging research and related theories showing that a patient's expectations and mood is important in how they perceive breathlessness. A study we did with magnetoencephalography found differences in brain activity in people with chronic breathlessness who were and were not given a cool facial airflow during recovery from exercise. A possible explanation for this finding is that airflow provides a pleasant stimulus, refocusing the person's attention away from the unpleasant stimulus of breathlessness, if you like, like a neural respiratory gait. When I first heard about so I'll leave it there, but that uh, video is available on YouTube and I think that it's really valuable to show our other colleagues that this is not just a gimmick, that it is actually, that it's great medical evidence. And when we tell our patients, we also have to stress that this is not a gimmick, that this actually does work. There's research to back it up. Um, you can actually, if you want, you can buy the... Um, 
patients can get on the Lung Foundation website and they can buy it. It's $12. You can actually Google and just buy handheld fans on the internet, but try and get one that looks like that because that's probably the one that works the best. There's also um, on the Lung Foundation another video that you can show your patients, which is more patient-focused rather than the one I just showed you. Um, I suppose the other thing that we like to try and get patients to do is to make sure that they're sleeping well and that they actually get some relaxation because if they're tired, symptoms are a lot more amplified. So really um, talking to people about promoting their sleep hygiene and giving them those really general instructions of, you know, cutting down the caffeine, uh, reducing the blue screen, uh, light at night, things like that. There's lots of different apps on um, the phone which are relaxed relaxation techniques which you can also help um, one tool that we do use and we re do refer patients to clinical psychologists is um, using cognitive behavioral therapy and there's some good evidence that this uh, can help as well and some of the main things that we um, do or the uh, clinical psychologist does is working through those unhelpful thoughts and doing those small acts of bravery I'm too scared to go out the house I'm going to get breathless walk to the front door walk to the letterbox and challenging that little voice I think people go I don't want to use the fan in public people will look at me and it's like no one's going to be looking at you let's let's go and have a look let's walk outside with the fan let's see let's count how many people are looking at you no one looks everyone's looking at their phones they're not looking at the patient so I think we have to, you know, really remind people of that. Breathing techniques and positioning, and this is um, great that you can kind of teach your patients some quick techniques that are some quick wins in, in the surgery, on a home visit, in the ward. And if you refer to Sims um, group, they can, they've got some great physios that can really go through these techniques. But breathing techniques and positioning really helps correct that inefficient breathing. When people are breathless, you see their shoulders go up and they're just taking these little breaths and they're basically, you know, lots of dead space and not actually moving much air at all. So by getting them to drop their uh, shoulders, concentrating on the out breath, remembering a lot of these patients are hyperinflated and if you're overinflated, you can't get any air in. So we have to blow the old air out so that we can get the fresh air in. So we want to reduce that dynamic hyperinflation and really start to use our belly muscles rather than our accessory muscles. Accessory muscles are great in times of, you know, stress, but they're not meant to be used all the time because they're inefficient and patients tire. So we do a lot about uh, breathing techniques. One of the easy ones that we teach people is purse breathing. That stents the airways open so you can get more air out uh, rather than if people are breathing very quick, often the airways collapse, trapping air behind. So what we say to patients is smell the roses, flicker the candle. Paste breathing is, once again, is trying to shorten the in-breath extend the out breath so breathe in for one step blow out for two or three steps so what we're trying to do is reverse that dynamic hyperinflation get more air out so that the lungs are back into a non-hyperinflated state and then they can start breathing again normally Control breathing, once again, this is something we practice with the patients, but concentrate on the out breath. When I talk to patients and say, when you get breathless, what do you do? I want to get the air in. No. Forget about the in-breath. Concentrate on blowing out. The in-breath will take care of itself. These are the little mantras that we'll go through with patients. Relaxed breathing is really teaching people to do that tummy breathing. So instead of breathing from their chest, we get them to put their hands on their tummy. When they breathe in, their hands should come out because their tummy uh, comes out. When they breathe out, their tummy goes in, their hands go down. Some of the positions that we'll get patients to use is the lean forward position. So sitting on a chair, but making sure that those arms are down. We don't want them up because that just makes all of our accessory muscles are actually being used to keep our shoulders up and we can't breathe. So shoulders down in between the legs and concentrate on breathing and that 
allows the diaphragm to be in a much um, more, I suppose, efficient position so that it can really help with the breathing. Um, if people are out and about, they can lean on their walking stick, lean on the back of a chair. If people can't sleep and they're really tired and they can't lie flat, uh, often lying forward and, and resting their head on a table can actually give them that really well needed rest that they need. And then we talk about all this relaxation and then I say, but you also have to exercise. And this is really confusing for the patient. So uh, what I talk about is we need to use our muscles, otherwise we lose the condition of our muscles. So we really want to promote physical activity. Don't say exercise to a breathless patient. They'll just tell you to get stuffed. What you need to do is say, let's just move a little bit more because we want to maintain your independence. So, you know, walk to the toilet, walk to the kitchen. Don't get your partner to bring you your cup of coffee. You know, put the remote control on the TV so you actually have to get up to the TV to change the channel. You know, put your mobile phone on the kitchen table so you have to get up and walk. All of those little bits of activity can actually help. Of course, pulmonary rehab is the gold standard. Um, I won't show the next video no. only because uh, we're going to run out of time, but that was Brian and he goes, you know, pulmonary rehab really works. It helps catch your breath. You know, you hate it for the first couple of sessions because every muscle hurts, but after that you can actually do more. And the more you do, the better you feel. A lot of people complain to me that they can't find a pulmonary rehab program. They don't know where to refer. Uh, you can go to the Lung Foundation website and they've got their own search engine and you can put in your postcode or your suburb and it will come up with different um, pulmonary rehab programs that are available. So it's quite a useful tool. Um, energy conservation is a really big thing. So patients will often get really breathless in the shower. So we have to give them some tips and tricks on how to manage everyday um, activities. And I suppose that the, the big key things that are big winners for my patients is walking aids. So patients think that a four-wheel walker is for people who are frail, who are at risk of falling. But if you actually use a four-wheel walker, you, you put your body in that lean forward position, your shoulders are down, and you can actually walk further and um, faster with a four-wheel uh, walker then without. And the way I get my patients to try it is I say, well, who pushes the shopping trolley when you go shopping? Oh, I do. Why? Because I can breathe better pushing it. Okay, well, you can't seal the shopping trolley. You can't take that home, but you can take a four-wheel walker. Let's try it. Uh, shower chairs, patient. I'm not going to use a shower chair. That's for old people. No one's going to know you're using a shower chair. Put it in the shower, sit down. That will save energy. It will save your breath so that you've got energy to get out and actually dress yourself. So once again, they become more independent. They're not relying on family to help them. One of the really uh, terrible things that patients find difficult is drying themselves after a shower. They've just had this high humidity um, rush with the steam so that's making it harder to breathe they've been using their upper limbs which means that they can't use their accessory muscles to help them breathe so they're usually very breathless and very tired instead of getting a towel and drying yourself off you use a terry toweling bathrobe so you get out of the shower you're dripping wet you pop the terry toweling bathrobe on and just sit on the loop and while you're sitting on the loo catching your breath in your lean forward position using your fan that terry telling bathrobe is actually absorbing all the moisture and drying them off. So all they have to do is get a little handheld towel, dry the bottom of their legs and bobs your uncle. And there's one of the quotes from my patients, simply the best. Uh, not all bathrobes are equal either. And I actually tried 10 different bathrobes to see which was going to be the best for our patients. And I found the Ikea one. It's not too long, so it's not a trip hazard. It's not too heavy so that it makes people really breathless trying to wear it because, you know, those really heavy ones. It's not too light. It is quite absorbent. It was the best and you can get it online for $40. So that's what I um, suggest. If you've got access to a, an occupational therapist, refer, 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 because they will help with a lot of these um, different skills. Last but not least, I'm going to quickly go through some different breathing techniques that we uh, teach our patients. Breathing around the rectangle and this is to stop that inefficient, ineffective. <laughs> and what we're doing is we're saying 
when you get breathless, look for a rectangle. Rectangles are everywhere. So, you know, your mobile phone is a rectangle. Your TV screen is a rectangle. Your windscreen is a rectangle. So breathe around the rectangle. So that long breath out, short breath in. Long breath out, short breath in. So we're preventing dynamic hyperinflation. We're doing a bit of diversional therapy. If I use the fan with this technique, you're also getting the cool air. And this is one that the patients love. They talk about, yep, I just breathe around the rectangle. Uh, if people don't like the rectangle, we've also got the three Ps, pause, position, purse lips. So stop what you're doing. If you get breathless, stop what you're doing. Get into your lean forward position, purse your lips, and just breathe. And that will help them recover their breath quite quickly. The other one is the three Fs. The men like this because they think I'm going to say something different. But it's lean forward, use your fan, focus on breathing out. Can you see they're all saying exactly the same thing just in slightly different ways? We print these out. They have the little cards. They stick it on their walker. They stick it on the fan. They stick it in their wallet. So if they start getting panicked, they have a look at it and it reminds them what to do. Um, the other one is stop, drop, flop. Stop what you're doing. Drop your shoulders and flop, lean forward. Um, and so I think I might, um, I've got one more slide, which is just the pharmacological interventions for breathlessness. Don't want to go too much into this, um, but we morphine is now indicated for the symptomatic reduction of chronic breathlessness. Uh, benzodiazepines are not recommended. There's quite a few, uh, there's a systematic review saying that it does not work you actually have more uh, adverse events um, so we don't encourage that but I think we'll have an intermission I'll stop sharing and I will hand over to Sim Hi, everyone. I'd like to introduce Sim before he starts. Uh, Sim is the uh, medical or the medical director, the managing director of Southside Physio. He's a physio himself and manages to fit a little bit of clinical work in as well. Southside Physio Group has two uh, physical clinics in Canberra um, with a strong uh, reputation for excellence in musculoskeletal conditions. It has more recently uh, developed the uh, mobile service, which is a multidisciplinary service that has physios, exercise physiologists, dietetics, diet, nutrition, um, occupational therapy and speech therapy. Uh, Sims team have been involved, were involved in the co-design phase of ABUS and they have been delivering ABUS since 15th of March and we're seeing some really great outcomes. So thanks, Sim, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Roz. Um, it, it pretty tough to uh, introduce me after Mary's um, expertise and, and Mary, I'd just quickly like to extend a extend a welcome to come to Canberra uh, at any point in time and we can run we can run up that uh, Telstra Tower mountain um, otherwise known as, as Black Mountain I believe. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Yep awesome okay well um, uh, as mentioned my name is Simon or Sim and I'm here uh, as a representative of Southside Physio and and we're so excited to be involved in ABUS. It's, it's been an amazing opportunity and really good fun. And we're, we're seeing some exceptional client outcomes or patient outcomes. And um, uh, that's really exciting for us. So uh, as mentioned, it is free. Yes, um, uh, everyone heard it right. This is a free service for community-based um, uh, patients suffering from breathlessness from some form of chronic disease. And, and we're lucky enough to have um, been successful in a tender with Capital Health Network um, and UTS, University Technology of Sydney, uh, uh, were also involved in the, the co-design and they're evaluating the effectiveness of this pilot program. So hopefully that's going to show some really positive results. And, and as mentioned, we commenced that in March. 
Uh, just a quick note that it is a quality improvement project. And so we are really trying to take as much feedback uh, as possible. So if you were to become involved and, and refer after tonight, please feed, feed uh, back to, to us as much as possible. So we are aiming for patients from GPs um, and we are currently working with two um, uh, uh, GP uh, or medical centres who are actively referring patients to ABUS and um, we're uh, looking to extend that, that welcome to other GP uh, clinics and I'm more than um, willing to, to come and present over lunch to, to the doctors and the nurses to be able to provide the information required um, to be able to refer to this free service. Um, and what we have found um, with the two facilities that we're working with is that building the, the referral form into your practice management software has been really effective in reducing any barriers in referral and increasing the speed of a referral. We all know that GPs um, uh, uh, tend to be short on time. So anything that can help with uh, uh, improving efficiencies. Um, is helpful. And if anyone would like um, uh, me to come to your facility and help with that, my email is simon, spelt simon, at sspg.com.au. I will repeat that later in the slideshow if, if you need it. So um, Mary has mentioned the, uh, Sarah Booth's work many times and, and ABUS is is um, uh, fits well within that framework, the, the breathing, thinking and functioning uh, model. Um, it is designed to help people with chronic illness gain control over their breathlessness and get more out of their life. So we look at doing an initial home visit by a physio or an RN and uh, approximately two to four follow-ups at home or by phone. And, and as mentioned by Roz, we're seeing some, some significant improvements in, in outcomes. So this is the really important information, who's eligible and who isn't. Um, now, luckily, you do not need to remember this. This is all on the referral form, which is on our website, and that's coming really uh, a little bit later. But really important that everyone understands that um, we, are, we are quite strict on the inclusion and exclusion inclusion criteria to ensure that um, uh, we are able to measure the QI project effectively. So they need to be an adult, um, aged 18 or over live in Canberra uh, or ACT with the funny Telstra Tower. They need to have a breathlessness, uh, sorry, an MMRC of two or more um, with impact on uh, their daily activities. We'll touch on that in a minute. And of course, they need to want to receive the ABES program after hearing about the potential benefits. We don't, uh, ideally, we have patients who are willing to engage in the strategies and, and the uh, the tools that we teach them rather than um, uh, patients that, that, that are less engaged. Um, so for, moving on to exclusion criteria, if they've had um, breathlessness for less than eight weeks, if their breathlessness has been caused by an acute event, such as an infection, um, if it's been caused by long COVID, or if the breath, breathlessness has no established cause. Um, cognitive impairment or limited English that impairs impedes their, their ability to uh, take on the education without support um, for a carer or interpreter it would also be an exclusion criteria. And finally, the patient, if the patient is expected to rapidly deteriorate or become clinically unstable over the next eight weeks, then they would be considered ineligible for, for the program. So I mentioned the MMRC scale. Um, so they need to be uh, equal to or greater than grade two. So if I just jump to grade two, a grade two on this scale is on level ground. I walk slower than people of the same age because of my breathlessness, or I have to stop for breath when walking at my own pace. So any patients who uh, suffer from that level of breathlessness or more would be eligible for, I'm going to say it again, the free service. Um, and we'd, we'd love to work with you and, and the clinic and the patient will hopefully get a really good outcome like the ones that have been through. So our final eligibility criteria is that um, we need to see an impact on their activities of daily living. So we ask, uh, what has your breathlessness, breathlessness made you less able to do? in everyday life that bothers you. And, and then the patients uh, can list the ADL uh, activity. 
uh, changes. So as mentioned, um, the referral form is on our website. So you see uh, we've actually got a beautiful new website at the moment. And um, uh, in the top right hand corner, there is a referral form button. You can jump down and the bottom referral form is the ABUS referral form. And as I mentioned earlier, would love to come to the clinic and tell you more about Avis and uh, help facilitate building it into your practice management software, which can then help with um, attaching medical history and past medical, uh, sorry, and medication list uh, along with the referral. So I believe we're leaving questions to the end. Um, uh, but as I mentioned, if, if you'd like me to come and have a chat, uh, Simon spelt Simon at sspg.com.au and SSPG stands for Southside Physio Group. Um, looking forward to uh, talking to questions at the end. Thank you, Sim. Back to you, Mary. Thanks. Okay, you'll have to talk me through if my if the wrong screen comes up again. Yeah, okay. Nothing yet. You're right. You're good to go. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. So um, I alluded to the number of different medication devices makes it really difficult for patients to be adherent to their, their prescriptions. Um, you know, back when I was a junior nurse 30 odd years ago, it was really simple. We had two drugs, Atrovit and Ventolin, and it came in a puffer. Uh, now there's, you know, over 30 drugs and there's all these different devices. And as I said, each device takes between 12 and 15 steps in the right order in order to optimise drug deposition into the lungs. So it is really tough. So what we uh, thought we'd go through quickly is how to use the multi-dose inhalers, the dry powder inhalers, the nebulizers, and the soft mist inhalers. Okay, so nebulizers. Um, the one good thing that came out of COVID was that there was a drop in the use of nebulizers, which is really good. Um, there's lots of good evidence to show that nebulizers should not be routinely used. They um, basically over medicate patients. So one nebula of Ventolin is worth giving a patient between eight and 12 puffs of Ventolin. And most of the side effects of Ventolin are dose related. So giving a nebulized uh, Ventolin dose to an elderly patient, not only does it give them tremor, it gives them tachycardia, they can flip into a tachyarrhythmia. It can cause myocardial strain. And we often see um, increased troponin levels with people that are using too much Ventolin. Of course, it's an aerosol generating procedure. So if you're giving somebody uh, a nebulizer in your, in, a, in your office or in a ward, it actually aerosolizes any airway viruses that they've got and you're going to spread it. Uh, patients, nurses, staff never wash nebulizers out. So once it's finished, it hangs around with that little bit of fluid in there. It gets hung on the back of the bed in the lounge room, wherever, where there's a bit of moisture and it can grow great green furry fungus. So we hate um, nebulizers. Puffers and spacers work just as well. There's a great Cochrane review looking at that. If you do have to use a nebulizer because some medications can only be given by, you know, certain uh, cystic fibrosis medications, if you need to give um, some antibiotics via nebulizers, please use a nebulizer with an exhalation port because that actually reduces the aerosolization, which is safe. So how to use a puffer? Eight easy steps other than those 12 or 14 different steps for each of the devices. So we want you to, or we want the patient to check the expiry dose and the dose counter, prepare the inhaler device, load the dose, and then the big step that nobody does, breathe out fully and gently. Remember, these patients that are being prescribed inhalers often are hyperinflated. So in order to get the proper dose, they need to blow out first. So blow out through pursed lips. That sense the airways open. You can get more air out. Pop the inhaler into the mouth. Needs to have a good seal with the lips, but in between the teeth. A lot of patients pop the inhaler into their mouth, but don't open their teeth so that when they breathe back, it just hits their teeth. So mouthpiece in between the teeth and then 
the next really important point that people haven't been taught. If you're using a puffer, so a PMDI, a soft mist inhaler or a breath activated inhaler, they need to breathe slow and steady. So it's just a... If they're using a dry powder inhaler, so it doesn't have a propellant in it, it has to be quick and deep. And if it's not quick and deep, the medication just goes into the mouth. It doesn't actually reach the target, the target organ, the lungs. And so they're wasting their medication. They're not actually getting the drug. So when you're prescribing, it's really important if you can try and prescribe either PMDIs and soft mist inhalers or dry powder inhalers. Don't do one of each. Because the patients then are going to have to remember, one, I have to breathe slow and steady, one, I have to do quick and deep. Which one's which? And if they get them mixed up, they're not going to get their drug. Uh, if you've got someone that's using a metered dose inhaler or a puffer, you must use a spacer. In the old days, we used to say you only use a spacer for kids because they can't coordinate inhalation. What we now know is that even people with the best technique with a puffer only get about 10, 12% of drug in their lungs. Uh, if you use a spacer, you can double that. And this diagram, I think, really sums it up nicely. With a puffer alone, a lot of the drug gets deposited in the mouth, a little bit in the lungs, a lot in the gut. Uh, if you use a spacer, minimal gets into the, the mouth, most of it gets into the lungs. So it's really they're getting bang for their buck. The medication they're taking is actually going to where it's supposed to be. Uh, in order to use a puffer and spacer, um, a couple of quick tricks. Uh, these, I'm more than happy to share these uh, slides so that you um, can teach your patients how to use your puffers properly. But puffer and spacer, remember the breathing technique is slow and steady. What you need to do is shake the inhaler. The inhaler usually has propellant and drug and they separate within 30 seconds. So it must be shaken in between each uh, activation. So it's no good giving it a shake and going squirt, 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 because after the first squirt, the medication and the propellant start to separate. So they're not going to get the mix of the two. Patients need to put the um, puffer into the spacer, breathe out fully, pop the spacer mouthpiece into their mouth and then start to breathe in and press down on the canister. And it's that slow and steady breath. Um, I often find that technique really difficult for people if they're really breathless. So I tell them rather than do one slow, steady breath with a spacer is using the spacer, squirt the medication and breathe in and out slowly four times. Then if they need a second puff, take the puffer out, shake it, pop it back into the spacer, breathe in and out four times. Back in the olden days, we used to tell everyone you need to... Um, prime your spacer to stop any drug from sticking on the side of the spacer. They're only the old-fashioned volume, uh, volumatic spacers. All the newer spacers are anti-static, so they don't, you don't have to prime them. Um, you do have to wash them, wash them once a month, warm soapy water, air dry. The recipe mat is a soft mist inhaler and it also requires that slow and steady inhalation. If patients breathe in quick and fast, it will just hit the back of the throat, trigger a cough, and they won't actually get the drug into their lungs. You do not use a spacer with a soft mist inhaler. Um, here are the steps. It's quite a difficult device to use in the fact that patients have to load the canister. And the canister is quite difficult. Um, they need to pop the canister on a hard surface and then they need to push it down quite hard until trying to see it so you can see it. And then they need to put the plastic casing back on to it. And then they need to prime the device. And in order to prime the device, the lid has to stay on. Uh, and then we turn the base once, we open the lid, and then we push the button and you probably can't see, but they need to do this three times until they see a soft mist come out. You can see it probably at the side of me as I'm doing it. Once it's been primed three times and you've got the mist coming out, then hold it up, doesn't need to be shaken, hold the top, turn the base, open the mouthpiece, breathe out away from the inhaler, chin up remember 
that opens the airway, that closes the airway. So I'm always telling my patients, lift your chin up, pop it in their mouth, press down on the button and breathe in slow and steady. Common problems are people will try and load it with the cap off and you'll actually uh, lose the medication. So it's always primed with the cap on. The Accuhaler and the Demo Inhaler, these are two different devices. Um, these are dry powder inhalers, CeraVent, Anoro, Brio, um, Ceratide, Pumacore, all come in these type of dry powder inhalers. So they need to check the dose counter and on the elliptic device, it's a very big counter, but on the Accuhaler and the Demo inhaler, the counters are quite tiny. So when you're prescribing it to patients, if they can't see, don't give them a device. If they've got cataracts or glaucoma and their vision is impaired, they may not be able to see the uh, counter. The counter is probably four millimetres high, so it is quite difficult. And the way patients use this, once again, a really common problem with the Accuhaler is patients think they just hold it and open it and load it. It actually has to be held horizontally. It's in the small print in the instructions and no one tells them. So you need to hold it horizontally, open it. You need to flick the lever across that loads the dose, breathe out away from the device, chin up, pop the inhaler in their mouth. And here, the breathing technique is quick and deep. So it's a... Hold your breath as long as comfortable and then breathe out. Uh, if a patient can't do that quick and deep breath, using a dry powder inhaler may not be the right device for them. The good thing about a lot of the drugs on the market now is that each class of drug comes in different devices. So you can get um, a, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist in a dry powder inhaler and a soft mist inhaler. You can get your inhaled corticosteroids in a um, pressurized meter dose inhaler, a dry powder inhaler. Um, so you can really try and if they can't use one device, you can usually get a similar drug with the same actions in a different device. Um, we've also got the hand inhaler, the Zonda and the breeze inhaler. These are also dry powder inhalers, but they require a capsule to be put into them. So with any of these devices, they have to open it up, open the mouthpiece and put a capsule in, close the mouthpiece, press a button, which puts two uh, holes in the capsule. It pierces the capsule. They release the button, breathe out, chin up, suck hard and fast on the dose, on the device, in order to disperse the drug into their lungs. Um, so each of these devices, you have to think, is the patient able, have they got the dexterity to actually put the capsule into the chamber? Some of them are quite fiddly. So it's a really good idea if you can, is get your hands on some of these demo devices so that you can get your patients to play with it and see if they can actually load it. The common problems with um, these devices is the incorrect storage of the capsules, the medications that go in it. Some of them are very hard to get out of the foil packaging and flat family members will open up all of the uh, capsules and put them on a plate for the patient to put in every day. Uh, they get affected by heat, humidity, um, so really they should be kept stored in their fo foil package until use. The other thing that patients will do is they'll either swallow the capsule because it looks like a medication won't hurt them but it doesn't help them because they won't actually get the the dose uh, they need um, and pushing the button to pierce the capsule some patients think that if you press it once it's good if you press it 10 times it must be better but what they do is when they keep pushing that button is you um, shatter the capsule so when they breathe in not only are they getting the medication now but they're actually getting bits of the capsule, which is sub-therapeutic. So only pierce the capsule once. The turbihaler, this is quite an old fashioned drug now, but works, uh, is quite easy to use, but it is a dry powder inhaler. Um, once again, small print, no one tells you, 
in order for this to work, it must be loaded upright. So you must hold it upright, turn the base all the way one way, all the way back until it clicks. You need to suck on the click. So when you load it, the click means it's loaded. When you turn it back, any residual medication is washed away. If they suck on the non-click, they get no medication. So it's all the way one way, all the way back till it clicks. Breathe out, chin up, device in the mouth and breathe quick and deep. If they only breathe, they're not getting the dose. It has to be a quite a quick, deep breath because you want to create turbulence within the device break up the drug and disperse it throughout the lungs. If they can't do quick and deep, dry powder inhalers is not the right thing. A lot of patients will breathe into this device. It gets green furry bits growing out of it. Always tell patients that when they are breathing out in preparation for the dose, breathe out away from the device. Uh, this device has a really small counter as well, so make sure that patients can see it. Don't get them to rely on shaking it because it will always sound like it's got medication that that noise is the anti-caking agent so this device is empty it still makes a noise there's no drug in it so they need to be able to read the counter and the counter is quite tiny the genuware is another dry powder inhaler it has um it comes as a llama or a lava llama a long acting muscarinic antagonist um, these devices are quite easy to use. However, once again, patients need to be able to do that quick and deep breath. So they need to hold it horizontally. They need to take the lid off and load it by pushing this button at the end. And when you do, you probably can't see my poor little cam, my, my device, but a little window here, it's quite tiny, turns green. Once it's green, we know the dose is loaded. And then what we do is we turn away from the device, breathe out, chin up, put the device in our mouth and breathe in quick and deep. And what will happen is you'll hear a click, which means the dose has been released and the window actually turns red again. If the window doesn't turn red, it means the patient hasn't breathed in quick or deep enough and the dose is actually still in the device. So it's it's a good device to check people's technique because you'll get the, aud the audible symptoms signal that it, the dose has been released but you also get the visual si uh, signal with the window changing color once again really important quick and deep uh, the elliptic device is similar to the acuhaler uh, and the demo inhaler uh, but this device as opposed to the acuhaler that has to be held horizontal this one has to be held vertical gets really confusing for patients uh, the good thing about this device is it does have a big counter so it's nice and easy for the vision impaired um, in order to load it all you have to do is pull the mouthpiece down to expose the mouthpiece the counter will drop down there's little um, vents here you don't want your patient covering it with their fingers they actually need that airflow to come in and to actually break up the medication once i put my the the cover down and it clicks the dose is loaded i breathe out away from the uh, device my chin goes up i pop this in my mouth and i breathe in quick and deep um getting a bit of a theme here slow and steady quick and deep um that's what you need to do the common problems is patients won't prime it in an upright position. They'll be reading it and looking at it and prime it sideways. And it just doesn't get the medication into that loading zone where it makes it easier to um, suck out. So just watch people when they're using it. The Spiromax is a really confusing device if you're um, not familiar with it. And unfortunately, I don't have a sample in front of me. As you can see from the picture, it looks a bit like a puffer. It looks like a PNDI. So people will want to shake it. It's a dry powder inhaler. It doesn't have propellant in it, so you do not shake it. Uh, in order to uh, make it work or to load it, you flip the lid down and you'll hear a click noise, and that means the drug is loaded. 
Thus, you do not use a spacer with this device. It does not have propellant in it. So once you've loaded it and you've heard that click, you breathe out away from the device. The chin goes up, you pop it in your mouth and the patient needs to breathe in quick and deep and they'll get that dose. One of the common problems I see with a lot of the dry powder inhalers is that the tongue gets in the way when people are using these devices. And if patients say they can taste their medication, their tongue's in the way. We don't have taste buds in our lungs. If they can't taste the drug, it means it's going to the lungs. If they can taste the drug, you ask them how they've got their tongue. And if they've got their tongue curled up behind their teeth, what will happen is the tongue kind of sticks up, so it goes like that. And what you need to do is, drop it. It needs to drop down to the base of the mouth, not fold behind the teeth. And once again, patients don't get told this. And it's only when you ask them, can you taste the medication that you know that the tongue is sticking up behind those teeth. Um, you can get this from um, the, I can't think of the website now. It's no, gone. I will remember. It will come back to me. But um, these are inhaler technique handouts, really easy to use. Um, but as you can see, it shows you all the steps that patients need to use or need to follow in order to get that optimal drug deposition. So you can print these off and you can use that when you're actually checking patients' technique. Have they done that? Have they done that? And then you can circle which are the errors that they're doing so that they can concentrate on improving those steps. Uh, MPS, medicine-wise, that's the um, website. And so there it is. And if in doubt, um, if you've got practice nurses, if you've got nurses that want, or even doctors that want to learn how to use um, inhaler inhalers, the Lung Foundation do um, digital inhaler device training, which is all just done over the web. The Lung Foundation will actually send you a box of placebos so that you can practice with them and show your patients them as well. As I said, otherwise, you can just go onto their website and show your patient those videos. And it's really important. Don't think someone else is going to teach them how to use these. Um, you know, it's everyone's job and we all have to be checking technique. We all have to be practising. Now, I haven't actually gone into the different drugs. Um, the COPDX guidelines uh, do a stepwise treatment of patients with COPD and what medications to use. And if we've got time, I'm happy to answer questions about, you know, stepping up treatment, stepping down treatment. Um, but I think I'll leave it there and hand back over to Roz and she can... Take over. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks very much. Um, so much information and experience. So uh, what questions do we have from the audience today? Um, we've got a couple of uh, questions from Dr. Bernard. One is, will the uh, slides be available after the session? We will let you know. Um, I haven't asked permission yet of the presenters, so we'll have a discussion around that and let you know. Um, and the other one was, can we accept referrals from over the border to ABUS? The answer is no for that. And Sim, I think you, you covered that actually in your presentation. Do we have any other questions from the audience, please? Okay, so I am not getting any questions at the moment. Is there anything, Sim or Mary, that you have thought of that you would like to add as the presentations? Okay, I have a question here from Carolyn Allen. Why sealed lips around the inhaler mouthpiece? Doesn't that make it hard to inhale? Thanks, Carolyn. Um Great question. And no, it actually works really well. Back in the old days, um, we used to kind of tell patients that, you know, it was okay to use the open mouth technique and do that. 
what we found is that a lot of the drug actually escapes and you're not getting the dose. So by popping the mouthpiece in the mouth, hmm, sealing your, your lips around it and taking that deep breath in, the drug deposition is a lot better. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here from a GP, Dr. Miller. Um, what are your thoughts, recommendations, current best practice for the use of oral morphine for breathlessness in a palliative patient? Um, great question. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, there's been quite a few studies about looking at opioids and breathlessness, and it doesn't work for everyone. Um, it seems to work best for patients who are breathless at rest, not so much those patients who are breathless on exertion. Um, and I suppose it depends on the disease of the patient. I can talk, I, I am, my, my background is, is uh, COPD and ILD. Um, and I am, we will try it. We firstly will try our non pharmacological interventions. So, I run a similar service to SIM. Um, we run our breathlessness service in, in Westmead Hospital. And as I said, once they go through the eight weeks, that probably 90, 95% of them manage their breathlessness without any um, extra medications, any morphine at all. So, hopefully, you know, this is, I'm sure that SIM will be getting the same result. So, I'd try that first because morphine does have lots of side effects. I know with my patients in the COPD population, um, liquid morphine doesn't work and it's because it's PRN. So, use it when you're breathless. So, they go, well, I don't, you know, I'll just sit and won't do anything. Then I don't need my morphine. So, they're actually, it's counterintuitive. So, um, we will use the long-acting morphine uh, it's because patients are quite good at taking regular tablets and it just takes the edge off the breathlessness. I think some of the barriers are things like the side effects of morphine. So you really do have to be on top of their, their nausea and their constipation. Um, but I would, before I go for, for oral morphine, refer to SIM first and see how that goes. And then uh, if not, um, yeah, definitely I'd try it. And there's some, some, there's some great information about how to use uh, the long acting morphine in patients with breathlessness. It's a good uh, question, isn't it? Because certainly, um, Geraldine, over the years that I worked in home-based palliative care, I saw the introduction of an opioid for breathlessness during the time I was working there. And um, we got quite confused about titrating levels of morphine for patients because their breathlessness was increase, increasing and becoming and there was this I witnessed this vicious cycle of uh, relying on morphine and then anxiolytics and it became quite messy so it's quite interesting Mary to hear you say that anxiolytics and certainly Dr Tracy Smith to say anxiolytics uh, are not recommended for these patients um, and, and but this is in the in the chronically ill patient so end of life different yes but our patients who have got copd ild yes um, things like lorazepam increase falls they get a tolerance and it has to keep going up and up and it just it has really negative side effects and i just say give them a fan and talk to them, refer them to SIM. Um, and it really does help. And with the increasing doses of morphine in our chronically ill, not our end of life. So I suppose um, uh, when I talk about my palliative patients, it's yes. management, it's not end of life. And I think yes. end of life is a very different ball game. But for our patients who are at home and they still want to, you know, get out and do things, um, there is a ceiling effect. And if, if the morphine isn't working when you've, you know, got up to 30 milligrams a day, it ain't going to work. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Good. Thanks, Mary. So just defining that for um, the participants is we're talking about palliative care being around the last six to 12 months of life. We're talking about end of life care, meaning um, 
what the last three weeks, months, months or two weeks. Yeah. So with those end of life patients, Mary, whether it be COPD or ILD, um, obviously, I guess they're not at the stage where they're coming into your clinic. Yeah, and I suppose they... that's why SIM has that one of the exclusion criteria is that a deterioration in eight for you know eight weeks because if they're approaching end of life, we've got some great palliative care services in um, the ACT, and they're probably better placed to deal with those rapidly deteriorating mm. end of life patients. Mm. So what SIM can do is help those patients, and we know that patients with chronic lung disease will often have as bad breathlessness as our oncology patients, but they have it not for three weeks, not for three months, three years, eight years, you know, and this is a really long-term problem. Yes. And these simple things that Sims team can do, they're amazing. And you you actually see patients walking in, they walk into the clinic and they're like this or they're being wheeled in. And then after the eight weeks, they walk in shoulders down and go thank you for giving my life back these simple things can make such a difference to our patients mm, yes totally agree I think as clinicians we always want to provide an intervention for these patients uh, and like I said my um, I was not skilled in knowing what that intervention would be uh, without knowing the breathing thinking functioning model and the appropriate interventions so uh, it's it's hard for us to be disciplined in in looking at non pharmacological responses. Um, certainly, I know the home based palliative care team in ACT. They have attended a workshop that Mary and Tracy Smith um, at, uh, ran at UCH. So, for those end of life dying patients, they also do have an understanding of this this model and interventions. Yeah, thanks. Great question. Any other questions from the audience? Sim, any other comments? Um, you had no. a great a great uh, news point actually in an email you sent us today with the uh, Jeep. Ah. Uh. Uh, we uh, yesterday I um, uh, spoke to one of the doctors who has been um, a big supporter of Abus. He's uh, referred, um, I'm guessing, more than ten patients um, to the program, and and he said how all his patients have been raving about um, the program and how effective it is, and he's really hoping that he can continue to send more and more uh, to the service. So. Um, if, if you've got any questions and uh, about what we've discussed today and eligibility uh, criteria and inclusion criteria for, for the pilot, then please reach out with my email uh, to my email and, and we can arrange a time to, to, to meet and discuss it. Yep, thank you. So we will send out to the participants um, the email addresses of both Sim and Mary and also the Southside Physio website where you can see the um, referral form and, and eligibility criteria. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Great that you could join us. And if you have any questions that you think about later or any um, or anything that Mary referred to around research or papers or uh, YouTube clips that she used. Um, I'm sure Mary would be happy to send through the links of those um, so we can continue supporting patients that are suffering debilitating breathlessness. So thank you everyone for joining us and we get a little bit of an early mark. Have a great evening and we'll see you next time. Please don't forget to complete the post-event survey, um, particularly if you're uh, would like the CPD points related to this event, but also to help inform us how we can provide ongoing education for you. So thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Goodbye.